Okay, uh, time for another video uh, here, and this time we're talking about Chapter 5. And Chapter 5 is about biodiversity, species interaction, and population control. So we start off by talking about the otter, and the otter is found along the coast of North America in the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, many of, most of them that are remaining now live in California, uh, but they live in that area up there. And uh, early on, when we discovered them, we hunted them almost to the point of extinction. And uh, now they're starting to come back a little bit, and partially because we realized that we were hunting them toward the brink of extinction, and we made them an endangered species, and so they made a bit of a comeback. It's a slow comeback, and uh, we'll talk about some of the reasons it would take a long time for a species to come back. But uh, we also have to ask the question, why would we even care about the otters? Uh, for one, they are a keystone species, and we've talked about that, how that'll be important for an ecosystem to protect the keystone species. And uh, another thing is tourism dollars. I mean, they are very cute, and people do like seeing the otters uh, along the coast. There they are, very cute. Okay, uh, their habitat is along the uh, coast, as we said, so in the ocean, and, uh, they, and primarily they live around kelp forests, and a lot of animals live around kelp forests. Kelp forests are areas of uh, high biodiversity, so lots of fish are able to live there. Um, and the otter protects the, um, the kelp forest um, because there's something called a sea urchin, and the otter eats the sea urchin, so that helps out a lot of other species by keeping their home intact. So there's a, another reason to keep the otters around. Okay, so uh, we probably already talked about this in class. Uh, in some years we do. Um, but there are five ways in which species can interact. So they can compete directly for resources. One species can prey on the other. That would be a predation, where you have a predator and a prey species, where the predator goes after the prey species. Parasitism, where the... Uh, you know, something attaches to the host uh, typically or lives inside of the host, typically smaller than the host, usually doesn't kill them, uh, but isn't so great for them either. Uh, mutualism, where both species benefit from the reaction, and commensalism is where one species benefits, but the other species uh, isn't affected one way or the other. Okay, so here you can try to guess the relationships between the species. Here are the lions and the hyenas. Uh, kind of like the Lion King, the Disney movie, right? Or the Disney play. Uh, but uh, here it's interspecific uh, competition. They're competing for the same resource, the hyenas and the lions. Okay, here's another one uh, that you can think about. This would also be interspecific competition. Here the plants are all competing for the sunlight. And uh, you can see that in your backyard if you've watched your plants compete for sunlight. You might be able to look into this picture and see other relationships between species, uh, but there's a big one right there. Here's another one uh, that we have referenced in class. This is a tiger and a jackal, and here the tiger allows the jackal to come and feed on what's ever left over when the tiger has already had its meal, so it really helps the jackal but doesn't hurt the tiger in any way. That's commensalism. Here is another typical case here. This is the acacia tree and ants. And here it is also a, uh, a uh, this is a, an example of mutualism. And the idea here is the ants chases away things that would feed on the acacia tree. And from that, the acacia gives some nutrients to the ants as well. Or the ant won't kill this, uh, the acacia tree, but it does keep away the other species that would harm it. So that's mutualism. Uh, here's one. We got a bird there, and that on the uh, right is an army, an army of ants, an army of army ants, and they go through destroying everything in their path. And this is a case of commensalism because the ants stir up a lot of other bugs, and the bird goes in and eats the bugs that get stirred up. The ants don't care about that, but the uh, the bird benefits. So that's commensalism. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is a fun one. This is bird poop here, and this is a case of mutualism. The bird gets the food of the berries here, and the berries get their seeds planted further away from where they were, so they get a chance to spread uh, because uh, you know the, the birds can't digest the seeds. 
Okay, so um, let's see. Sometimes there's going to be competition between resources, and the competitive exclusion principle really just says is that that competition cannot go on indefinitely. At one point, one species is going to have to outcompete the other. And that means the other species will have to find something else to do, move on, or if they can't adapt in that way, uh, they may die off. But the, the competition can't go on forever. I always wonder about the competition and how this applies to human beings, too. It seems there's a lot of competition in the fast food uh, industry. And uh, there's only so many people to eat the food, I guess. But, um, yeah, I wonder how that affects people. Lots of other products as well. There always seems to be a CVS across the street from a Walgreens, and I wonder about that competition for a similar product. Okay, so um, we could talk about this, uh, these interspecific relationships. Uh, and uh, predation is one of them. So, um, you know, this is where the predator species is going to go after a prey, and they have lots of different ways that they can go about doing that. Um, you know, a spider spins a web. That would be another one that we could talk about. So they could capture them. All kinds of different things. And this goes on with predator and prey species all the time. And uh, here's a famous one that we know from the cartoons. The coyote never does seem to catch the roadrunner. Coyote and the Roadrunner. Hmm. You're trying, Coyote, trying to be the predator, but uh, the Roadrunner seems to keep getting away. All right, the prey isn't just uh, interested in being a meal, so they have different ways of trying to get away. And here are some of the different things that they could do. Uh, deceptive behavior is one. There's a possum pretending to be dead, and then the uh, predator might move on and doesn't want a dead meal and then the possum turns out it's still alive. Chemical warfare is another a way to avoid being coming uh, somebody's dinner. And Pepe Le Pew and other snakes, uh, some snakes, other skunks, will use chemical warfare to avoid capture. Okay, so there's another idea for you. Let's see what I got going here. Okay, so um, here are uh, some deceptive behaviors or different ways, I should say, that species avoid uh, avoid becoming a meal. Uh, the span worm is one here. Uh, here's a leaf insect. It looks like a leaf, but it's actually an insect, so that's some camouflage. Uh, beetles will spray you with some things you don't want to be sprayed with. The monarch butterfly uh, doesn't taste too good. And then the viceroy butterfly probably tastes pretty good, but it looks like the monarch butterfly, so uh, it gets to survive. Here's a moth that makes it, with the uh, wings there, kind of makes it look like it's got giant eyes, so that avoids predation. The poison dart frog might be tasty, but you die, so the predators might avoid that. Hey, and do yourself a favor. Google up uh, images or short videos of a snake caterpillar. The caterpillar makes itself look like a snake. So these are ways to avoid becoming a meal. All right, so here we are back to the kelp forests, and like I said before, they are very diverse, so there's lots of biodiversity there, so there's lots of reasons uh, we know we like to preserve biodiversity, or that seems to be a good thing to do. And as I mentioned before, uh, the kelp forests are in danger from sea urchins, and that's why we need the otters to take care of the sea urchins, and also from pollution and uh, from global, well, from the warming of the sea temperatures as well. So here is a kelp forest. It does. It looks like a forest, right? Um, but this is underwater, and uh, that's that's good habitat for lots of animals, a like great food source. And uh, there you go. Lots of biodiversity in the kelp forest. There's the there's the urchin that puts the kelp forest in danger, and will consume the kelp if the otters aren't there to keep it in check. Okay, so let's see. Um, we're talking about all these different uh, evolutions that go on and the way things are changing over the time. We've talked about natural selection as well. And uh, predators and prey can drive that evolution. We call that co-evolution. So, uh, you know, if there, here's an example of a, a, a bat and a moth. And the idea here is that moths that are faster will be able to elude the bats easier and so they are able to pass on uh, and reproduce more, pass on that trait. So the bats by going after the moths drive the natural selection of the moths getting faster and faster. And uh, same with the bats. Uh, bats have uh, echolocation. Some uh, members of the species are going to have better uh, traits that are going to allow it to catch the moth and they get to survive.
So the moth gets faster, the bat gets uh, faster, or gets uh, more intense in its use of echolocation or other ways of tracking the moth, and the arms race continues back and forth. Okay, so we talked about another uh, way that species can interact, and that's parasitism. So again, the parasite attaches itself to the host or lives inside of the host and uh, slowly destroys it. So um, here's mistletoe, which is a parasite that destroys trees. Uh, the ash borer is another parasite that destroys trees. That's a big deal right now. And here are the lamprey, the blood-sucking lamprey. So you can see them inside the trout, and the trout doesn't die right away. Uh, but it's not too happy about having blood-sucking lampreys on it. Who would be? Really, think about it. Okay, so in mutualism, we've already talked about that, and in mutualism, both species benefit. We have bacteria that lives inside of us that helps us digest, so we have uh, bacteria inside of us that's actually a good thing, and they're happy to be inside of us because um, the food that they help to digest is coming their way pretty regularly if we're lucky. Okay, here's a couple of other ones. Uh, yeah, this is a rhinoceros, and these birds over here, they will eat the bugs off of the rhinoceros, so they'll ride along. And the rhinoceros is happy, because now the bugs are gone. So they have a nice mutualistic relationship. Here is a clownfish and a sea anemone. Uh, the clownfish uh, gets protection. It's, uh, the sea anemone will sting other fish. So the clownfish uh, are less susceptible to that. And, and then the clownfish also drive away species that would uh, destroy the anemone. So they have a, a nice relationship. And of course, who is our favorite clownfish? Uh, who are our favorite clownfish? Uh, you know, oh, there's the ox, uh, ox uh, peckers that keep the rhinoceros from having a lot of bugs. There's the sea anemone. And yeah, back to my original question. Who are our favorite clownfish? Uh, the most famous clownfish of all, of course, uh, Marlin and Nemo. I think we found them. There they are. And they're happily reunited. Okay, so commensalism we've talked about again and uh, before, earlier, we've mentioned all of these. And in commensalism, one species benefits and the other doesn't. So here's another example, birds nesting in a tree. The tree uh, isn't benefiting, but the birds have a nice home. So that would be commensalism. Um, here's one where there is this uh, nice flower here, uh, the Rumiliad apparently, and it doesn't harm the tree, but it needs the tree trunk uh, to grow. So there you go. All right, so let's see. Uh, natural uh, selection is going to talk about um, reducing competition because maybe you are in competition, but there are some members of your species that can do things outside of where you're competing. And then natural selection will uh, benefit the species who aren't in direct competition, the members of that species that aren't in direct competition with another species. So uh, natural selection can cut down on that as well. And that should make some sense. Pretty amazing, uh, the things that are going on here with the idea of resource partitioning and the way different animals will share the same resource, but maybe use it at different times. Or uh, maybe they will use different parts of the resource. And there's some great examples of that. And, um, well, well, here's a diagram in a general way to talk about the idea of the species. They have an area of niche overlap, so that's where their com the competition is going on, and then eventually they're going to, one way or another, <clears throat> divide, whether it's because of the competitive uh, exclusion principle, they can't compete against these things forever, uh, and uh, maybe there's some natural selection driving that, um, or maybe there's this idea of the resource partitioning, where they decide to use it in a different way, share it in a different way. And here's an example of all these different warblers who, uh, I guess, apparently became different uh, types of warblers, but they would use the same tree, but they would use different parts of the tree. So I guess at one point or another, they uh, divided the territory, and even within the same tree, they're going to use it in a different way. And I thought that was fascinating when I saw that. Okay. And then, uh, same kind of thing here, the uh, fish will, maybe the same resources going on, but if you've got a longer curved beak, you can get at it in a different way than a species with a different beak. So um, here's the idea of species that once had the same ancestor, but have adapted in different ways. And that's the idea of, uh, you know, moving on. Moving on so much that uh, eventually maybe you have a brand new species. Pretty fascinating, at least I think so. 
Okay, so what are the things? You can't, a population can't grow forever, and the human population is no, no exception to that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what are the things? There's going to be a limitation of the number of resources. That should make some sense. And um, the competition is there, too, so you can't grow forever. You're going to have to meet with some kind of resistance along the way. Now, um, the way you do grow, the populations do grow, is going to depend on where the members of the population are, how many members of the population you have, how old are the members of your population, or how young are the members of your population. A uh, better way of saying is that is what is the age of the population. That'll uh, dictate somewhat how the population is going to, uh, to be set up. And the dynamics of population is the way that populations are always changing. So that's the dynamics of populations. Okay, so um, now uh, let's see. So there are different things that would make uh, populations change. One is the temperature, or if there's some kind of disease going on that could wipe them out. The um, availability of resources, competing species coming in. All these things are going to change the way populations are acting, and that will uh, change the outcome or the destiny of those species. Okay, so um, there's different ways that the populations can live together. One is they can clump up, so they're all in a bunch. One is they're just like a uniformly distribute, distributed, so they're just completely even. I think of a tree farm on that, where they plant the trees evenly, and some it's just random where the members of the population will be. Why would a species clump together? Well, for one thing, if you have a bunch of species uh, of the same species together and you're sticking together, you have a better chance of reproducing. You have members of the same species right there with you. Another thing is it could be defense. Uh, you know, uh, sticking together, strength in numbers could help you fight off a predator better. So that's a good reason for clumping. And of course, there's some downsizes to having everything together too. If all of your population is in one spot, then if some disaster comes in, you're more likely to have um, a big percentage of your population wiped out. All right, so populations can uh, change. They do change. They're going to grow. They're going to get smaller. They're going to remain stable. And basically, here is the formula that dictates that. Uh, births plus immigration. Immigration is new members coming in, minus the deaths and the emigration. Emigration will be members of your uh, group that are leaving. And that's how it's calculated. Right, we talked about the um, age distribution, right? If you have many members that are pre-reproductive age, you're not about to be uh, growing your population. If your members are post-reproductive age, still, you're not going to be growing your population. It's your population in the reproductive age that's going to dictate the immediate change in your population. And the pre-reproductive <coughs> age that's going to dictate what's going to happen in the future, now, what's coming up the line. Okay, so here's some terms to talk about, J-curves and S-curves. <clears throat> so get ready to be talking about J-curves and S-curves, and I'll have a diagram and we can explain these concepts a little bit more. But biotic potential is how much potential your population has to grow, how many resources are available, what's, uh, what's going on there. Biotic potential is low, you have a low capacity for growing. If you have high biotic potential, you have a chance for a big growth uh, spurt. And uh, animals that are larger usually have a low biotic potential. It's going to take a lot to increase their population. And that's part of the problem with the otter. And for a high biotic potential, um, they can grow pretty quickly. Bugs and bacteria are like that. Uh, they have a high biotic potential. The intrinsic rate of increase, this R, this small r, these are, this is uh, the kind of growth that you would have if the biotic potential was unlimited. This is where you would have a big, big growth and in a hurry. That's without any resistance. What are you capable of? How, how much growth can you have? All right, so um, of course these uh, populations are limited by the resources. So what do you have available? How much food is there? Um, how much uh, competition? How much chance is there of being coming a prey species? All these things are going to affect the size of the population, diseases as well. So all those things can affect how, how large the population is going to be. All right, so all of these things together are called environmental resistance. And carrying capacity K is just the idea of, well, where is the limit? The limit to this amount of growth that you can have. 
Exponential growth is where you're kind of unlimited. You're growing very, very quickly. Uh, you're, you're continually growing the population. That's what humans are doing now. And logistic growth is where you've leveled out, where the population has uh, leveled out and is not growing anymore. And that's uh, where you've reached the carrying capacity. Okay, so here is a diagram to talk about this. There is the biotic potential, and uh, you can see that with the blue arrows, and the biotic potential is saying grow, grow, grow. This is where you've got your exponential growth. Uh, that's where you've got high biotic potential, and you're hitting your intrinsic rate of growth, your R uh, there. And the uh, red arrows pushing down are the environmental resistance that's keeping you from growing. And that line there, that orange line, is the K, the carrying capacity. And that's where you've reached about the maximum that you can, and the population stabilizes out. So that's the idea there of the uh, diagram and the words that we've been talking about. So um, we can talk about species that are hitting the intrinsic rate of growth, the biotic potential, where the blue arrows are. They would be R species. And then there are species that have kind of reached their carrying capacity, and we call those K species. All right, so the carrying capacity is going to depend on a lot of different things. So the things are going to be in flux. So there's not a number that's going to stay the same all the time, um, but there's a number that's there for the particular time that you're talking about, and then you can talk about the factors that would change that. Okay, so this uh, reproductive time lag, if you have uh, reproduced and you have all these members of your species there, but you've run out of the resource, for a while the species will keep growing, and then there's going to be this dieback, this crash, when you run out of the resources. We'll have an example of that in a little bit. Okay, so if there's some kind of damage, and that's why we talk about destroying habitats and all that, of course we're going to change the carrying capacity of an, uh, of a, uh, an area. So we do have an effect on the carrying capacity of different species around us. Okay, so here's the example I was talking about. These are reindeer on an island. I believe in uh, Siberia, and here's the idea. You know, they uh, were over. They overshot their carrying capacity, but it took a, a while for the population to die back down. So there's the idea of that die back. All right. So here again, we talked about R. R is where you are meeting with. Uh, you know, you're, you can grow as fast as you possibly can, and that's R selected species, and then K selected species are where you've kind of hit the uh, carrying capacity. And, there you go. Our selected species, they say, are opportunists because when the conditions are right, boom, they're going to have a big growth. And uh, here's an example. Bigger animals, mammals, like I said, are more K-selected species, like a rhinoceros. And something like cockroaches are R-selected. They can grow real fast, grow in a big hurry. Okay, so there are things that can affect when you have a small population. Of course, we're going to start talking about smaller populations, especially as we are limiting the populations of species by our actions. So the founder effect, this is the idea of the genetic diversity. So if there are a few individuals that go off and form a new area, their genetic diversity is probably less. There's less to draw on. The majority of the population is back farther. So that can affect what the genetic population is, and that can affect the traits that can get passed on. Uh, demographic bottleneck is a similar thing. Think of a bottleneck. The idea is that a bunch are trapped in the bottle and a few of them can get out. Maybe it was a hurricane. Maybe there's a, uh, a volcano. Something happened. Uh, genetic drift is where uh, one trait is going to be helping the other one, uh, is going to turn out to be very helpful all of a sudden. We talked about the moths in chapter four, where the darker color moths had a an advantage all of a sudden, and now they had the unequal reproductive set uh, success, and there was a big genetic drift there. Inbreeding, when you have a small population, is a problem because you're breeding uh, members that still have the same kind of traits, and um, that's a problem for uh, you know cutting down on the diversity. And taking all these things into effect, we come up with something called the minimum viable population size. And that uh, minimum viable population size is, hey, you know, how few can we have to get the, the, the species surviving for the long time, the long term? That's the minimum viable population size. And if we know what that is, we probably, if we want the species to continue, we won't go be uh, below that. 
Okay, so I talked about this before, about the idea of density. This is the clumping idea. So uh, there are things here that are going to control your population that depend on the density. If you're all together and you're easy prey for a, a predator, they're going to have more to hunt. So uh, that's going to be one thing. Parasites can spread or infectious diseases can spread a lot easier if the population is dense. And uh, also, uh, that means that there's going to be greater competition for the resources. Okay, so populations can be stable, or they can be eruptive, where they jump up all of a sudden. Mosquitoes after rain uh, would be a good one. And some that are uh, cyclical, that are going to have this boom and bust, and some are just kind of hard to predict. So uh, that's going to be the idea of different population changes. Um, here is a population cycle for uh, predator and prey species. And the idea is, you know, when the population of the uh, predator gets too high, that's going to drop the population of the prey. And then when the population of the predator drops because there's not enough prey, gives the prey a chance to go back up. So here is a, a dynamics for a population change between two, uh, a predator and a prey. Okay, and as I said at the beginning, people are not exempt from this. Uh, many, many people died in Ireland not too long ago in the 1800s. That caused a lot of uh, emigration from Ireland, a lot of immigration to the United States and other places. Uh, we've had diseases that have uh, wiped us out. The bubonic plague, plague wiped out a good percentage of the population. AIDS also cut down on life expectancies and had a big effect, um, mostly starting back in the 1980s and the 1990s, and still does affect the world, um, although we have gotten it under control in the United States. Um, so people are not um, exempt from this. And here's another thing that we could talk about, and you know this in New Jersey, is the deer population. We have gotten rid of the predators uh, around here. We've gotten rid of the wolves and we've gotten rid of the coyotes. So the deer, the deer are growing in a, uh, an alarming rate. So there's a lot of deer out there without the predators, and also we keep going into their habitat. So we know that there's a lot of uh, interaction between deer and people. Okay, back to the slideshow here. Just took a little break there. All right, so what happens to the communities and the ecosystems that, of course, this is going to affect how the organisms living there are going to adapt. Let's talk about that a little bit. How do they change a little bit? And uh, one thing that we could talk about is primary succession and se secondary succession, and then that'll lead to what we call climax communities, where they've kind of kind of reached where they're going to be. Um, okay, so um, things uh, start off from the beginning where there's nothing at all. Maybe there's rocks or maybe there's gravel or something like that, and they're going to need soil to have plants, to have producers. Um, and this could also be that there's no, there's nothing in an aquatic system at the bottom there, too. So then there are going to be early species that are going to come in. A key one is the lichen. That's L-I-C-H-E-N. It's a combination of a fungus and an algae that is kind of resilient and can start gripping on to uh, surfaces and get the start of form in a soil. Of course, this stuff has to happen over time, but there has to be a start to it. So then you have species that will come in at the beginning and are able to handle uh, living in those environments, and then as it develops, uh, different species will come in, and then there's the uh, end of the setup there. Uh, so that's the idea of the different successional uh, species that you could be talking about. And here's an idea of it in a picture form. Uh, so, you know, you have your rock, and there's the lichens and the mosses, and then you get small things, and then you end up with these trees in the end. So that's the idea of primary, secondary, and then climax communities. Okay, so um, in secondary succession, you already have the soil, so you don't have to start from scratch. I think like a baseball field. If a baseball field is left after a while, there's not going to be any field. The plants are going to take over. I've seen that happen a few times. And uh, in my yard as well, <laughs> I've seen that. I try to get rid of the weeds, and they're going to come right back. Uh, so that's secondary succession, where you can start up uh, not from scratch. Uh, okay, so um, maybe uh, there's going to be some kind of uh, disturbance that's happened or something that causes this succession to be wiped out. Like I said, if we decided it was going to be a baseball field and then we abandoned it, and that could be something that was going on. And then there are also sites, and we'll talk about it later, that we've degraded due to pollution, but then we brought back. We made them uh, viable again. 
Oh, okay, so these are the type of plants that are going to come in, and we can get a good idea here again of uh, secondary succession. So you can start with these weeds. I can attest to that in my yard, that's for sure. And then eventually, if you let things happen, you'll get trees growing up. I've seen a lot of that in my yard, too. All right. So um, if you are talking about these successions, this is building up in biodiversity, so that's a good thing. And um, then you can have more reactions and interactions. That's the idea there. And we've talked about, again, the idea of disturbances that could happen. And here are some good examples of some disturbances uh, that could cut, uh, cut these successions short. Okay, and I guess, you know, we're kind of talking about it here as if there's a lockstep kind of deal here. But they're really all over the place. Different things are going to happen. And we're just talking about general trends here. Okay. All right, so here are things that are going to uh, determine whether a system is going to be able to sustain itself or whether it's going to be able to change. So inertia and persistence is if there's a small uh, bit of things going on and you're able to survive that. And resilience is if you're able to come back after there have been some kind of disturbances. Can you come back? And a tipping point is where things have gone so far that you just can't come back anymore. There have been forests that have been cleared out, cleared out, and finally the plants aren't coming back, and then it goes from erosion to a desert. So you turn from a forest into a desert, and that's a hard thing to come back from. So that's a tipping point that we're talking about. And of course, we're wondering if we're hitting tipping points because of human actions, things that we can't come back from. And that's a big discussion in this course. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it was helpful. And I look forward to seeing you back in class.